I've got some great news for you. As you see here, all we are doing for chapter 10 are these uh, three pages. So pace yourself. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to spend much time at all on chapter 10. This is largely a lab chapter where you're going to be looking at uh, specific muscles and identifying muscles, uh, naming muscles, and that's really lab stuff. So I just want to focus on a few ideas for you uh, from chapter 10, and this is really all you have to know from chapter 10, uh, and then we're good. I just wanted to talk just a little bit about some ways we classify muscles. So again, I'm not going to name individual muscles so much as I want you to be aware of how do we classify them. Uh, the four ways we can classify muscles, depending upon the movement, are prime movers, are, are called agonists, uh, antagonists, synergists, and fixators. A prime mover is the muscle that's mainly responsible for that particular movement. And so you can think of it as, quote unquote, the most important muscle uh, for moving a particular uh, bone in a particular joint. So that term, agonist, means that is the main uh, muscle moving that particular bone for that particular movement. An antagonist is going to be the muscle or group of muscles that opposes it. If you think about, again, the, the biceps brachii and the triceps brachii, I'm out of camera range here, uh, you have two muscles that work in opposition to each other. Uh, since muscles can only shorten and then relax, the way you get movement to occur the other direction is by a different muscle, one that opposes the first muscle movement. So prime movers and antagonists are going to be muscles that are going to be opposite on a joint working in combination as one contracts, one relaxes. A synergist is a, a muscle that might assist the movement of the prime mover, uh, assist its action rather. So if you have a muscle that is uh, contracting like this, there may be like the brachialis is another muscle that can assist the biceps brachii in that movement. So synergist, synergism means to help or assist. So some muscles are classified as synergists for a particular movement. And then fixators are going to be muscles that might provide extra stability, extra kind of a point of almost tacking down a muscle to make it easier to bend at a joint. So a fixator is going to be a kind of synergist, but its main job is to give you kind of a stable point, like a pivot point to allow a uh, to allow movement at a particular joint. So again, I'm not that concerned that you're really able to classify muscles, um, a particular muscle in all these different ways, but I understand that movement requires muscles to do different things. Sometimes they are the prime mover, sometimes they're the antagonist, sometimes they're assisting a movement, and sometimes they're serving as a particular kind of synergist as a fixator. Uh, when you think about how we name skeletal muscles, uh, hopefully you've been practicing this in lab and you're aware that we didn't give them random names. Uh, the names usually mean something. So I give you these uh, little pointers as different ways that we have named skeletal muscles. Location, of course, shape of a muscle, describing something as a deltoid, since that means triangle, tells you it's a triangular muscle. Uh, we talk about muscles based upon size. We can have a maximus, you know, the gluteus maximus or the gluteus minimus. We can talk about longus or brevis. Brevis means short. So we use size sometimes to discuss or describe muscles. We talk about direction of fibers. So rectus means straight. Transversus means across. Oblique means at an angle. So when you hear these terms, don't just kind of, oh, I've got to memorize rectus abdominis. Think about what that means. These are muscles that are running straight down a plane in the abdomen. A few others, we also describe muscles based upon origins. And if you see biceps or triceps or quadriceps, you know this. Location of attachments, sometimes we refer to the attachment point as, uh, or one of the attachment points as a way of naming that muscle. And even the action, if you hear a term as a flexor or an extensor, it tells you maybe where it is. If you're talking about the extensors, sorry, extensors in your fingers, okay, any muscles that are kind of causing that action are going to be extensors. Those that do this are flexors. So think about also the action. Then I give you my own advice. Here's how, these are some things that I use as a way to remember muscles because there's a lot of them. I would always recommend that you find a landmark. 
when you're trying to identify a muscle in lab. And one of my favorite muscles is the sartorius, I'm not sure why, but whenever I'm looking at leg muscles, I find that muscle first, and then I go, okay, since I found that muscle, I know the one that's on this side of it and the one that's on that side of it. Sometimes that's easier if you have a landmark. Do look at muscles very carefully. I know I've done the same thing that you're trying to do in lab. You're looking at all these muscles in a big list and you're trying to name them all. It's better to take just a few minutes and learn two or three than try to take 10 minutes and learn 20 of them because you just have a hard time keeping that many in your head. So look at muscles carefully when you're trying to learn them and focus on their names. If you see a name like sternocleidoid mastoid, it's actually giving you a lot of information in that name. Uh, it's helping you, in this case, figure out the two places, or actually three places, where this muscle attaches. So think about when you hear terms like infraspinatus, or you see the term like longus, or you see a term like brevis. The names actually mean something. Palpate yourself, and uh, well, I'm trying to be funny here, and it sounds kind of dirty, but it isn't. But when you start t doing things like, this is my masseter muscle, and you start feeling that, and you talk about muscles, my frontalis and occipitalis, and you, you actually are touching those muscles as you're naming them, then it's, it gets a little easier for you to visualize those muscles. So, you know, palpate just means to feel as you are describing it. So, try that. Uh, focus on one region at a time. Don't try to learn all the arms and legs in, in, in one sitting. Try to learn the leg muscles and then come back to the arm muscles later. Uh, that way you can start to learn what muscles are associated with each other. Those are just some good tips. And finally, you may find for some muscles it actually is easier to learn their insertion and their origin. That may not seem true to you because you don't want to memorize a muscle name and to other places with it. But for certain muscles, you may find it easier to go ahead and learn the insertion and the origin. So what I want to wrap up with here is uh, one kind of final idea related to muscles um, and how their fascicles are going to be organized. The, the important idea here, remember, we go back to fascicle organization when we looked at muscle anatomy. Muscle fibers are arranged in bundles. They're arranged kind of in cables. And that arrangement tells, uh, it tells us a lot about how that muscle is going to contract and what's going to happen when you have particular kinds of movements. So just some brief examples. When we have muscles that have circular fascicles, we tend to see these things represented as either sphincters or as kind of gates. So abicularis oris, abicularis oculi, you know, the muscles, your winking muscle and your kissing muscle, but also sphincters. We have a lot of muscles whose, or muscles whose job is to actually close off. And if we think about um, uh, a, yeah, a sphincter in your stomach, for example, its job is to close and open. So circular arrangement of fascicles allows it to kind of be a oh, can close by contraction, can open up, be a gatekeeper. Convergent fascicled muscles are going to be like you see here, where all of these fibers all go to the same tendon. And they tend to give us these fan-shaped muscles, like the pectoralis major. We have another arrangement where we have the fascicles run parallel to the, to the axis. Hey, Sartorius, uh, you see all the fascicles are going to run like in this direction here, and that's going to be one kind of organization. They could be strap-like, like you have here. or there should be a comma or a semicolon. Uh, or they could be like this. All of these fascicles are running like this the same way also, but the belly of that muscle, remember the belly is the biggest part of the muscle, is enlarged, so we refer to that particular kind of parallel arrangement as fusiform muscle. And then finally, we have pinnate muscles. Pinnate means feather, and here's sort of a good example of that. All the fas fascicles, fascicles rather, are attached to a tendon obliquely. They're all attached like this, sort of like a feather is attached to its main shaft. I'm not going to be concerned about you knowing about unipinnate and bipinnate and multipinnate like you see up here, but um, the fascicles are going to be arranged in kind of these um, feather-like arrangements, which actually does make that muscle quite strong. So as we conclude this part, and let me get out of the way.
come over here. Um, muscles shorten, uh, muscles can shorten more rather if they have, uh, if they're parallel with the fascicles. Uh, this, the sartorius can shorten quite a bit, as can the biceps brachii, because all the fibers are running in this direction. It's not as easy for that, of course, to happen if it's a circular arrangement. And muscle power is related uh, to the number of muscle fibers involved. So we see something like this multi-pinnate uh, deltoid here, or we see these um, arrangements with uh, unipinnate and bipinnate. And they may not look that powerful, but the more muscle fibers involved, the stronger, the more powerful the contraction. So you actually can have a deltoid be very strong because of all of the, the arrangement of the fascicles. When they all contract, it's just lots of fascicles in there with lots of muscle fibers, you get a very strong contraction. So you'll learn about muscles more in lab. Uh, here's some muscles. Okay, you're not, you're not getting the muscles thing there. Uh, actually, you'll learn more about these muscles in lab, and there you'll learn about specific muscles. And uh, you're going to learn roughly 70 to 80, maybe 90 muscles, more the, more the superficial muscles. Again, for lecture purposes, I'm not going to ask you to memorize muscles. But again, this is the entire Chapter 10 coverage that we did here in this video. So again, focusing on uh, basics of uh, fascicle organization and some terminology. One thing that we're leaving out in particular is the levers. Uh, there are class one, class two, and class three levers. We're just not going to focus on them in this class. So if you decide to go on to kinesiology or physical therapy, you'll do more with them. Otherwise, we're going to skip them for now. That's it for this video. Thanks.